Hi, my name is Mary Terzillo. Um, my aim here is to talk about how we could use, how we can inspire children don't feel to. Feel obligated to use that. That's just here for sound. You, you, you can walk around. You can walk Thank around. Thank you. I am obviously a complete amateur at this, <laughs> so forgive me. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. My name is Mary Terzillo. I'm uh, a science fiction author, and uh, I know a little bit about the history of the space program. So if I make some mistakes, please feel free to correct me quietly afterward. So this is about <laughs> this is about Mars evolving vision. Maybe that's not a good title, but it's basically what I'm doing is I'm trying to figure out ways that people can encourage children to build rockets, to uh, get into the space program, uh, to colonize Mars. Uh, this is the, the move outward that we need in young people. So that's my, that's my basic idea here. I wrote a book called uh, Mars Girls, uh, available here for 16 bucks. And uh, I have some other books, but they're, si they're poetry, so you're probably not interested. This is how it starts. And that's what happens. <laughs> that, incidentally, is my husband. <laughs> Lots of possible seed ideas for kids. Now, I'm, these are classic books. These are things that have inspired people in the past. And if you look at some of the, the rocket scientists we have today, uh, these are the books that they read. These are the books they read. OK, so this book was a real, real inspiration for the space program. Uh, and you probably don't recognize it. I had never heard of it until recently. It's called Two Planets. This is a much sexier cover. And it does have a girl that looks like that in there. Uh, Martian girls, by the way, they can interbreed with human beings, which is kind of interesting and drives the plot a little bit. But they kind of look like that. They've got big eyes. They're tall, and they're very slender and beautiful. What's the date? Uh, uh, 1897. <laughs> I'm not very good with it. <laughs> but this is not an 1897 cover. This is a translation. Uh, and I, I think it's only been translated once. The translation, this is a 50s translation, I think. And it's, uh, I am not going to say that it's a bad translation. I'm going to say that it was very literal, I think. And that's, the author was probably trying to be very literal. And that's why it was a little bit of a difficult read for me. But I did manage to get through it. I thought it was a fabulous novel. I'd like to see it made into a movie. Basically, what happens in the movie is um, some polar explorers, three of them, uh, Torm, uh, Solwitz and Grunthe, I'm mispronouncing those names, go to the, the uh, North Pole and they uh, make an amazing discovery when they encounter accidentally a, a group of, of Martian explorers. Has somebody read, read it here besides me? So now I can say anything and you'll believe me. <laughs> Anyway, but what happens, okay, so the Martian explorers, they, are, they live in a very utopian world. First of all, they have a method of space travel which involves using materials that are opaque to grav gravity, because you see gravity is like light, so you can have something that's opaque to it, and that means that they've mastered gravity. That's their way of space travel, ideal. They also have a lot of other very interesting ways of, of uh, coping with the world. One of the things that they have, I, I'm not going to tell you everything that's weird about the book because it's got some great, you know how science fiction readers like things that are just a little bit you know, strange. One of the things, and it plays a plot role, is that Martians believe that eating is private and it's somewhat obscene. You don't do it with other people. You can drink with other people. And this becomes a plot thing because uh, two of the girls try to pass themselves off as humans, but they just can't eat in public, so they, they are uh, blown away. Well, anyway, so the, the, the story goes on, and it's worth uh, trudging through what I think is, is rather difficult reading. It reads like a technical manual, except if you can get below the surface, it's really I thought a fabulous novel with a lot of interesting twists and turns in it. A love affair, uh, another love affair, a thwarted love affair, war between the Martians because the Martians, when they come to Earth, they're going to they're going to pacify us. They're going to you know they they their method of warfare is you know here's a battleship attacking us, so we'll just disable the guns. You know here is a, a man with a club, we'll just make the club melt. Uh, this is the kind of thing they do. But when they actually come to Earth, then they start becoming the masters. And you know how power corrupts? This is not the phrase that Kurt Laswitz, the author, uses, but power corrupts. And so the Martians become corrupt. And finally, there has to be a conflict. But the conflict, finally, through the, the, uh, of the marriage of an earthly man and a Martian beautiful Martian, probably that Martian beautiful woman, they solve the problem. So it's a fabulous novel. And it was an inspiration to this guy. 
Okay, and he writes, in the, and, and is, this is amply uh, documented elsewhere, I shall never forget how I devoured this novel with curiosity and excitement as a young man, and we all, may also realize what fascinating possibilities are opening up for the generations of the 21st century when through the expansion of the universe our dreams and fancies will become reality. So what kind of a, this is, this is a book that has land, uh, a landmark as far as influencing the world, and you know, I've read it. I don't know how many other people have. I'm sure somebody has because it sold uh, copies, certainly. Um, so, you know, and this is what we finally got from Von Braun. So, um, now there's another book. Now, <laughs> I have to tell you something. I was, I took Russian when I was in college, and I was, you know, I took the right, second course. It was very difficult, very difficult for me because the teacher was a psychopath. Um, it wasn't the language difficult. The teacher was a psychopath, seriously. And uh, she reduced a woman to crying once because she couldn't remember a vocabulary word. Anyway, so, um, anyway, so this is Ayelita, and I said, I said to myself, why is it that in my third, you know, third uh, semester of Russian, they didn't tell me that Tolstoy had written science fiction? Well, <laughs> Alexei Tolstoy, a distant cousin of Lev Tolstoy. Okay, so it wasn't the same guy. Um, so anyway, this is th this <laughs> this is a little bit not not quite as close a a causal relationship as perhaps I've I've uh, suggested with Von Braun, but um, Sergei Korolev was so important. He was known as the the the, uh, the chief designer, and I won't go into that. But he was the, his identity was protected, um, <laughs> and he in fact was not assassinated. Um, in one biography, it's explained that uh, Korolev's uh, collection of literature was as vast as his collection of technical material, and I said especially Tolstoy. And I thought, okay, they're saying Lev Tolstoy, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was his distant cousin, Alexei, who wrote uh, uh, Aelita, I guess it's called, uh, which pr prizes, and I think a space mission has been named after. Okay, this, I couldn't, you know, I could not resist this. I, I, this says Cat Country, okay, and it's a book that was written I have to tell you, it's in America. It, the story is basically uh, the, the, um, the hero lands on Mars. His um, companion is uh, quickly devoured by uh, ravenous birds, and he's, ca he's captured by cat people. I mean, how cool is that? Well, the, go the story goes on. He escapes from the cat people and is taken under the, under the wing of... Um, a demagogue who is uh, clearly corrupt. Well, now, everybody in America says that this book is basically, those that have read it, say, and I know some people that have reviewed it even, uh, say that, okay, it's, a, it's an allegory. It's sort of like the same thing as Gulliver's Travels or, uh, I don't know, uh, it, it, but it's not really about Mars. But you know, if I were reading this book, and I, I, I did read it, I took it as a book about going to Mars, frankly. And I think there's a mistake by saying that, well, science fiction, all science fiction is an allegory about other countries, about otherness, you know. I think it's to make science fiction less, um, less popular, <laughs> less populist than it is. Anyway, so <clears throat> that's one cover of it. Here's another. This is the uh, English edition of it uh, uh, by Lao She, who eventually committed suicide, and he was uh, politically persecuted very badly. Um, China is extremely interested in, um, that's going up or down? It's, okay, I don't know if I have two seconds, two minutes left, but whatever it is, I'll just keep talking until it says, eh. Um, okay, this is, this is a, a rover and lander uh, that the, the picture was released on uh, 2016 and it's supposed to be on 2020, I believe. So the Chinese have been extremely interested in Mars colonization. Um, the, we, my husband and I went to, to uh, China, and uh, we were so, uh, my, my husband is a, is a Mars scientist, and we were so uh, inundated with comments. We went to, uh, to middle schools, and the children, I, I thought at one point they were gonna smother him trying to get uh, autographs. And the same thing was a lot of the people that we met in uh, both industry and in sci and science and in um, uh, science fiction world was our uh, host. And uh, they were extremely interested in anything, that any little scrap of information he could give them about Mars. So it's it popularly there, Mars is extremely uh, a target, and uh, this is just one example. Okay, here is, uh, now what happens in Japan? 
uh, because we know Japan has a wonderful uh, space program. Um, I know enough Japanese, like I know maybe three kanji, <laughs> and uh, that one says Mars. I know the, those two. That, it actually says Fire Planet. Uh, that's a cartoon. This is a video game because I found that the influences in, in Japan tended to be more in terms of video games and manga. Uh, this is a translation of a Mars novel, Mars Crossing. Um, and here is a, uh, here is a, a mission that they're going to have to uh, Phobos and Deimos. Um, so th this is, I'm not going to go over it because I don't think it's, you know, that's not relevant. Well, the relevant thing is that there's a tremendous interest in colonizing, uh, in not colonizing necessarily, but exploring and eventually, I imagine, colonizing um, the, uh, uh, the red planet, as is evidenced by the, the fact that there's a video game, which is basically, let me go back, this, uh, Aria. Uh, this is set on a, on a, um, a terraformed Mars. And a lot of, their, a lot of the, the manga and games are set on terraformed Mars. So there's a, a big interest in that in Japan. And I think it stems from things like this. That's how we get kids interested. That's how we get kids interested. So uh, tomorrow's inspirations. Um, OK, that doesn't have anything to do. Oh, that's the time. That makes sense. Thank you. OK. <laughs> So uh, t tomorrow's inspiration, The Martian, certainly accessible uh, to uh, everybody. This is not a technical manual. This is a, this is a book with a riveting plot. Uh, Mars Crossing, uh, another uh, people abandoned on Mars, uh, trapped on Mars, and uh, managed to rescue themselves. Uh, a tribute to the human spirit, to ingenuity. Um, Fires of Freedom is a, is a little bit different. It's about uh, Mars as a prison colony. But it's still, I think that's a wonderful cover by Jerry Cornell. Um, Larry Niven's Rainbow Mars, which is uh, a little bit more comical in its, uh, in its approach. Um, David Brin's existence is not actually about Mars, but it's about the future of humanity. And for that reason, I include it here, including his short story, Mars Opposition, which is available, uh, by the way, in, uh, in audio form on um, Starship Sofa, I think is the name of the site. Martian Race, fabulous novel. Uh, and only one of them. This is my. Uh, this is the story that I won the Nebula for. Mars is no place for children, which is unfortunately totally out of print. I've got to figure out some way to get that back in print. Uh, and this is this is the way I hope to motivate future Martians. Uh, this is a this is a novel, which is up here. Uh, basically, it's about two girls. One of them is 16, and uh, she's boy crazy. And you think she's kind of like an airhead, but then you realize no, she's trying to have a world for herself. She's trying to have a life for herself. She's <clears throat> she's, in a, um, she's in a situation where her parents are, are trying very desperately to earn a, a fortune through uh, doing technologies which is available only on Mars. And you know, there are types of experimentation that can only be done in certain kinds of, of environments, namely sterile environments. And uh, different types of things like uh, mutations happen faster. I, I, go, I mention it briefly in the book. Uh, but her parents want her to follow along with it, and they never consider that if she does that, she's never going to marry, she's never going to have a child, she's never going to have a social life. So she's going completely in the other direction. The other girl is a girl who has contracted, and actually this was inspired by a talk that I heard at the, at the Mars Convention some uh, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, cosmic radiation is going to give rise to leukemias, uh, to various different kinds of blood cancers in children, particularly. I mean, not that we, you know, we got to do something about it. We, we're still going to have children there. Um, but um, um, a Capera, um, Smythe, is, in fact, has, uh, she's, this is, this is Nanoani, this is the, the airhead girl. Um, but Nanoani is, uh, uh, Capera is, has leukemia, and she's trying to get an opportunity to get back to Earth so she could be treated there, because apparently, for one reason or other, you can't treat it on Mars. There isn't the technology. Um, she, um, and that's just a plot point, it's my gadget. I'm sure that they'll have perfectly good technology for treating leukemia on Mars, but I had to have that. So anyway, but, uh, so the two of them are going along and they're unlikely friends because Capera is 11 years old and, you know, and Nanoway is 16 and what kind of, you know, but they're the only people they know. They don't know anybody else, so they, they're friends. Okay, so um, one day Capera comes and she says, well, you know, somebody just trashed my entire habitat and kidnap my parents. So this is sort of the inciting incident, as you were. Um, they have a number of different enemies. One of them is the corporations that own the two families. 
And the other is people who believe in the face on Mars as a religious thing. They, it's definitely a godhead, and it's leading them to an exoplanet which might not exist. And the facers on Mars want to take the two girls to the exoplanet to be breeders there. Well, you know, that's fine, except maybe the planet doesn't exist. So that's my uh, plot, and I'm hoping that I get people interested in going. And I particularly want to show uh, two young women who were uh, courageous and wanted to battle the, the forces of nature and the forces actually of human beings. Uh, and that was my point there. Um, so basically, what I'm saying is that uh, these are just some, some of the books. And man, I want to tell you, if you want to be inundated, I mean, with, with the names of books, just go Mars Novels and Google it, or go to, inside, go to Wikipedia and uh, look and see what it says about you know, the, the lists of books. And, you know, and there's things that are even left out. I found out um, this. I didn't even know this existed. You're, okay, cool, cool. So we belong to a club which is growing, thank heaven. I was, I asked my, I asked somebody, I said, can you name women who have written about Mars novels? Because, yeah, women write Venus novels, asteroid novels, space, you know, Mercury novels, whatever. But Mars seems to be a peculiarity of, can you name the Mars novels written by? Uh, well, yes, mine, but uh, <laughs> Lee Brackett, yes. Well, they're up there. So the and and uh, and um, uh, C. L. Moore, um, the one I wanted to have, I couldn't find a cover for uh, Chamblot, which is actually a novelette, I believe. Um, so you know, we're forming a club here. We're we're the ones that uh, are going to, and there's more of us, from what I understand. Uh, I haven't met all of us. I don't even know everybody's name. But you and I are members of a very rarefied and uh, powerful club, and I hope we can do what we can to uh, promote the idea and to entertain people at the same time that we encourage them to think about, hey, let's go there. Let's build rockets. Let's uh, build a space program. And that's, that's my whole goal in life. I have the book here. I've got some bookmarks, too, if you want, or postcards, too, if you want them. And uh, that's, uh, you can find me. I'm on Amazon on Facebook and uh, MaryTerzillo.com. I don't know what the URL of my Amazon page is, but it's a really nice page. It's got more to it than that. Oh, and by the way, a lot of the stuff I write, you might not like because it's poetry, but, you know, you might like it. I don't know. I have Mars poetry. <laughs> well, I have some. Lovers and Killers is poetry. And I have a, a po book called um, Your Cat and Other Space Aliens. But what I'm looking at right now is Mars Girls. So that's my, that's my enthusiasm right now. It's something that I'm, you know, trying to get in the hands of young people. So that's it. Questions? Oh, yes, sir. That's either Samurai or Scaramouche. <laughs> they're twins, and they're really hard. I think, Scaramouche. is it Scaramouche? Oh, oh, because it's a shoulder cat. Yeah, OK, yeah. By, you know them by behavior more than anything else. Yeah. They're red, so they must be Mars cats. My next <laughs> book, incidentally, is, which I, is, I'm not quite finished with, is called A Mars Cat and His Boy. Uh, and then I've got another one, which is more adult, because it's got things like uh, predatory um, sex bots that are, and it's called Isidus Rising, and it's a little bit, it's about, it takes place in a prison on Mars. Not an original thought, but it's, it's there nonetheless. And it's also about the human spirit. Yes, ma'am. The character in Mars Girls that also, that shows up first in your story, Mars yes. Girls, yeah. uh, she's not only female, she's African American. She's a little African American girl. Get into uh, issues of class, uh, uh, even a little bit of religion, so how did you manage yeah. to you know, besides the fact that the inspiration I got from the Mars Society, I've got six minutes, besides the inspiration I got from the Mars Society, there was, an, there was another thing. The Sojourner rover, my, my husband was on the Pathfinder mission, and he has an experiment, actually, on the Pathfinder. Um, and you may know that the rover was named as, by a, um, a contest, and um, children named the contest. I don't, I unfortunately can't remember the name of the little girl that named Sojourner. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Now I know, and I'll have to write that down. Um, but Sojourner is the name of Sojourner Truth. And Sojourner Truth was black, and she was also a freedom fighter. And I thought, hey, you know, I'm going to make my, my little girl uh, part of that tradition. And father, her father, I, you know, I created a family for her. Her father was kind of a, uh, 
he started out life as a, as a criminal, and then he sort of reformed. And the mother is kind of so prissy that she kind of, you may sort of want to slap her sometimes, but she's very earnest and, and wants, to, wants to build a world. So, other questions? My husband is sitting there in the blue shirt. His name is Jeff Landis. Yes. And uh, let's see. The, is he on there? Mars Crossing is his book. And he has copies of it, by the way. Yes. How did you serve as a writer? I found a book that was called The Golden Egg Book. And I was five and a half years old, and I finished reading it, and I thought, I just read a book. And then I thought, those are words. I could do that. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I am serious. I thought, and I've, I've been writing ever since I was actually seven, maybe. Yeah. And how did I get interested in Mars? I was walking down a path, oh my God, in Michigan, very lonely place, very, very isolated place. And I'm looking up, you know. And at that time, you could see the Milky Way, you could see, um, you could see the Aurora Borealis, and you could see Mars. I was about eight, and you know, I just, that was it. I was, you know, I just knew that was it. And then I got books and stuff, yeah. Just had to do it. Thank you for asking. Oh, I got four more minutes. You can sell books? I can sell books. <laughs> 16 bucks. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, I've got two books, two stories coming out in analog. One of them is about self-driving cars, um, and it's called Car Talk. And the other one is called Hobson's Choice, and it's about depriving, basically making people happy by depriving them of choice, which in fact doesn't make them happy. And it's sort of an old-fashioned concept, but. So those are coming in analog. They're not quite out yet. I think I'll just sell some books now, I guess. Yes. <laughs>